Commodities Outlook panel. Uh, so joining me on stage, I have Karina Bader, Research Analyst at Acorn Capital, uh, Clyde Russell, Asia, or, sorry, David Franklin, you switched. <laughs> David Franklin, Head of Funds Management at Argonaut, and Clyde Russell, Asia Commodities and Energy Columnist at Thomson Reuters. So thanks for joining me here today. And um, so I thought we could just kick off, um, I think, you know, looking at geopolitics and, you know, how do you see the environment impacting the metals, mining, investment industry? So looking at supply, demand, pricing, et cetera. Um, you know, what, what's kind of some broad, broad factors that are uh, happening right now? So, Karina, do you want to start? Okay. Can you hear me? Oh, there we go. Um, I'd say... Probably the key feature I'd categorise the market at right now is volatility. Um, every week you get a different set of signals, so it's actually really hard to start seeing beyond the, the very short term into the mid term. Um, clearly the China reopening story that I think at the end of last year everyone was anticipating would deliver a, a huge demand kick to the economy hasn't um, occurred. There was clearly some pull forward of uh, demand before that reopening, which has then resulted in some uh, inventory build-up. And then you've seen that that has actually resulted in softening commodity prices. Um, not necessarily... I mean, you did see the lithium price come right off, but it hasn't certainly gone back to where it was two years ago. Uh, and possibly it's bouncing around the bottom right now. Um, and But all the other industrial uh, complex metals have dropped off. And you're starting to see now a, a bit of recession um, coming into the market, which looks to be dampening the short-term demand. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think you're right, Karina. I think um, short-term is very uncertain um, because uh, the recovery from China hasn't quite been as strong as you would have thought um, and there's increasing concerns over, you know, recessionary fears and just how slow the, the global economy will, will, uh, will, will slow down. Um, but... Um, but I think you've also got to stand back and you've got to say, you know, there's some key resilient themes there that short term it's kind of hard to see what's going to happen, but long term the position is still very good. Um, and that is really energy transition and, uh, and just I think we're entering an era of increased geopolitical risk and that's going to have positives and negatives. So, you know, the way we look at it is you've got to kind of look through the short term uncertainty, uh, but the story around commodities I think uh, in the medium to long term is really good. The way I look at it, I tend to uh, follow trends quite closely. And if you actually look at what's actually happened in the pricing, in amongst the, the volatility that you see on day to day, which is often driven by news headlines rather than uh, fundamentals, but the, the trend overall this year has been quite clear. All major commodities are down apart from gold. But as I say, gold is the anti-commodity commodity. Um, so if you're looking crude oil, LNG, coal, copper, all the major stuff that I look at, aluminium, they're all trending lower. Yes, they have little recoveries, but then the overall trend is lower. If you're looking at geopolitics, um, while Russia's invasion of Ukraine continues to grab headlines, and it's, it's, it's a, an awful situation and a, a human tragedy, on the commodity front, uh, the impact is largely gone. Um, it was mainly felt in energy commodities, but the one thing the oil market in particular is very good at doing is... Uh, adapting, and they've adapted very well. So the Russians are still selling all their oil. They're selling most of their products. That's where the one uh, area where they've had a little bit of struggle. Um, it's just who's buying it has changed. Uh, the major beneficiaries of the war in Ukraine are effectively China and India, much more so China than anybody else. But the Indians are enjoying uh, cheap crude and high margins on their exports of, of refined fuels. I also find it very ironic that for those of us who drive diesel SUVs or or use, um, chances are it's you're driving it on Russian crude because Australia imports most of its crude, I mean most of its diesel from countries like India and China, even though it formally comes through Singapore. But that, that's just the way the market works. There are risks around that. There are tremendous risks. A lot of the uh, shipment of oil and products has gone into the dark fleet. Lots of old ships, probably not very well insured. This all works until it doesn't. There's an accident, some leak, and then you discover that there's not really insured and no one's there to clean it up. But anyway, that, that's so I think the, the impact of, of, of Ukraine is largely gone. Um, you then are then, and the current dynamic is really a race between 
the optimism over China, which has been fading, and the increasing worries and signs of a slowdown in the rest of the world. Uh, I've, you know, in, in my sort of, well, I don't want to really age myself too much, but, you know, I've lived through several economic cycles, and one thing central banks and governments have never been able to do is deliver a, a successful soft landing. What makes everybody think that this can happen this time is, is, is curious to me. It's never happened before. So I would expect, you know, you either you don't have a recession at all, that it's somehow avoided, um, or we actually end up with a recession and all we're really worried about is, or all we really have to discuss is whether it's mild or severe. Um, you know, so it's, it's, and it's almost too early still to say that. But the longer interest rates remain high, the longer inflation remains a problem, uh, the more likely it becomes a, a you know a, a, a more severe slowdown. In that case, that's never good news for commodities, um, other than gold. And I would expect to see, you know, prices um, will, will continue to struggle. Uh, on 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 China, it's it's kind of interesting. I, th I think you're right. There was a lot of pull forward. You saw that in iron ore. You know, they took in a lot of iron ore. They produced a lot of steel, and then they're not really using it. So that's the kind of problem of. Um, you know, are we still going to see an acceleration in the second half, which is what everybody's banking on? If you look at the very bullish oil forecasts in particular, that's all really built on, on China really going gangbusters in the second half. Um, again, it's almost too early to say, and I think you just have to be driven by the data. You have to look what's actually happening. And if you're doing that, then the ones that are the best forward indicators, like PMIs, they're not looking crash hard. Um, I just want to let the audience know that we will take questions throughout. So if at any point you have a question for the panelists or want to kind of add to the conversation, just put your hand up. Um, can we get a microphone over here? Having kicked around in this a bit, you know, um, battery materials wasn't a, an expression 10 years ago, um, but it is now. But it feels like, to me, outside of lithium where there's just a structural <coughs> um, short, uh, shortage that just can't be solved between 20, here and 2030 as EVs ramp up, that things like nickel where we've seen Xinxian et al revolutionise Indonesian production, <coughs> graphite where we've seen, <coughs> um, I guess, Syrah had a huge deposit, very fine, but uh, graphite's flipped um, to be a fine product rather than the, the flake product it was 10 years ago. Uh, copper, I guess, is structurally short, but economically, as you said, it's got a downside. Where, um, where is sort of the the upside other than other than lithium? Um, is it uranium where we're perhaps we're underestimating uh, how much base load? nuclear is going to go in um, and the forecasts are fairly pedestrian in terms of what we're actually expecting. Where's, where's your upside um, with surprise in, in, a, in a commodity because we know most of it, you know, as I said, other than lithium, um, where there's a supply um, crunch for the next five or so years. <coughs> um, it's difficult to sort of estimate something that, we, that everyone hasn't already worked out. Yeah, I'm happy to have a crack at that first. Uh, it's a good question. Um, uh, I think I think you've got to look short term and long term, and maybe just talking through some of the commodities. I think copper short term is uncertain because at the moment the majority of demand is kind of industrial uses, and uh, and that's going to slow down, and that's why the copper prices come off. But if you look at uh, you know five ten years, I think uh, the outlook for copper is you know very strong. So as an investor, the view we take is we're cautious now. Uh, but I actually think the next 12 months is probably the time to build exposure to copper while prices are down. So by good quality companies at, uh, at good prices. I think the point you make on, uh, on nickel, and I put cobalt in the same position, is if you look back two years, they were the commodities you had to be in. Um, uh, demand was going to be very strong, supply was going to be constrained. And what you've seen is just by technology changes and government policy in Indonesia, uh, those markets have, have totally transformed. And uh, the outlook for those commodities has, um, you know, ha has come off. Um, so I think you've also got to have an awareness of, uh, um, of what's happening in the industry. On some of the other commodities, graphite I think is fascinating. Um, 
uh, it's the one sort of battery material that price that hasn't really moved. And I think there's a couple of reasons for that. You know, one is at the moment the economics simply don't add up. You know, it costs as much. Um, you know, it costs about the same as as you can sell it for. Um, and um, and what you need is to just demand to keep increasing. Um, and we're not quite there yet. So you need demand to exceed supply. At the moment, supply seems to exceed demand, and you've got the synthetic uh, side to it as well, which, which has an effect. The other thing is most of the new projects are in places you don't really want to be, you know, Mozambique and Madagascar and Tanzania. So um, so I think there's some, some issues there, but I think it'll get there, but again, it'll get there in time. So what we're focused on now is those commodities that, um, as much as possible, are protected from an economic slowdown in the short term. So I think things like uranium, I think there's still a question about, I think it'll be part of the solution. I don't think it, it is the solution, um, but you'd suggest that the uranium price looks pretty firm. I think rare earths um, also looks, um, looks like it's coming off its bottom and, and, and recovering. And, uh, and I think lithium, after taking a bit of a pounding over the last uh, six months, uh, we'll probably have a pretty good uh, remainder of 23. Um, but, you know, to me, um, uh, you've almost got to, in the short term, you've got to react rather than predict. Uh, but I think the long term for a lot of those commodities is, is pretty good. Yeah, uh, at Acon, we're not macro um, top-down investors. We try to look from the bottom up and pick good quality assets that we think can ride through any particular cycle. However, you always have to have an eye to what is happening globally. Um, I'd agree very much with what David's uh, already spoken about, but uh, we try to have a fair diversity as well um, and look at the stages of development of companies and where they are in the cycle. So the challenge in the short term is if there is softness, um, those companies that are looking to raise capital are going to be the ones that are hit hardest the most, which then comes back to the point as a longer-term investor, which we are, that may be an opportunity to get in at, at a very good price that in two years' time you'll be rewarded for that um, taking on that risk. So there is some equity factors at play. Um, companies that have a single asset whether it's in a difficult jurisdiction or not. We were just speaking earlier about how long it's taking to get projects permitted and that is only just getting longer and longer and longer. Um, consequently, the barrier to entry of new supply just keeps growing, whether it's because of ac lack of access to capital and in the short term you'd argue all of those developers are really going to struggle to raise capital to progress their projects, which is just going to feed into the longer term supply shortage. Um, then there's the risk factors around the permitting and how long that takes. That leads to capital needs. The longer it takes to get permitted, the more money you need, the more working capital you need. Inflation is clearly going to result in higher capex numbers in two years' time than it was two years ago. Again, raising capital. Um, and then you've got the risk around jurisdiction and commodity prices. So it's actually a really tough area to deliver returns as a, a company. Um, and so there's a lot of barriers to those entries and investors have to think about those when they're looking at their investments, both in the short term, what are the capital needs, what are the risks in the short term, and then, but ultimately, if they can get through that, those risks, where are they going to be in two or three years' time? Yeah, I, I think it's interesting. I mean, these guys are investors. I, I'm a, uh, well, they represent investors, let's put it that way. <laughs> um, I, I'm a, a sort of helicopter analyst. So I'd sort of look at, um, if I was looking at picking commodity winners, which is not something I think you really should do in some ways, but um, I look at where, where, are the, where is the, the hardest to get new supply and where are the, you are least likely to be engineered out. Everyone three, four, five years ago, it was cobalt. Oh, we're going to be short cobalt. All the cobalt's in, in, in Congo. It's a horrible place to go. Uh, but what actually happened is cobalt was not effectively, it was largely engineered out of batteries or the demand picture altered quite dramatically. The same with nickel. You had a, a major change in, in how it was produced, um, and you know suddenly no one really talks about nickel shortages. So you've got to be wary of those kind of things. So what are the commodities that can't be engineered out or and where the barriers to producing more of it are, are high? And that would, you know, you always come back to copper on this one. Um, you're only going to get so much more copper out of recycling. You're probably, it's, it's, you know, along with aluminium, it's really essential in most of the things that are going to drive the energy transition. So therefore, that's a good one. Aluminium, again, high barriers to entry. It's expensive and difficult to build uh, aluminium smelters. Um, you're going to have a whole range of ESG issues on them. 
Um, is the aluminium market going to split between green, clean aluminium like what is produced in my home state in Tassie or the coal-fired, dirty aluminium that really dominates China? So things like that. Um, I think if you start to see that split happening where the, uh, green aluminium commands a premium, then that's a good thing to start looking at. Um, and the other one that I think is quite interesting and no one really talks too much about is zinc. Again, it's, it's, it seems to me a commodity that no one's really putting a lot of exploration effort into or a lot of development into, but it's going to be one that the demand should rise quite strongly as, as the energy transition gathers steam. So that would be one that I would look at. But I also think you've also got to look at the commodities that are likely to, to lose out, and, and that would be cobalt for one, um, nickel for another, and you know things like manganese, you kind of get iffy lead, Again, the, I mean, all those ones that are small markets are, are quite difficult. Tin is, a, is, is one that's a positive because, again, you know, most tin is used in solder, but it's going to start being used in a, in a range of other things as well, I believe. If, you know, the engineers tell me that. Um, so there might be more uh, tin demand coming. But the point is these things are not happening right now. These are like five-year stories. So you've got to have to take a longer-term view. Uranium is interesting. I mean, the one thing we do actually really have a fairly good handle on is how many nuclear plants are under construction and where they are. Um, and they take a very long time to deliver. The Western world is not really, it's moving away from nuclear, not going towards it. So the nuclear demand is, is almost, it's almost 90% China story. And they're not really going to be getting uranium from the Western world. They're going to take it from the, their friends in, in Central Asia. So I'm not sure I see a strong demand for uranium coming down the line. Um, you know, there's an existing demand that will remain. It's quite stable, but there's not a huge amount of nuclear power under development outside of China. Um, so you started to talk about kind of the narrative of, that's been going on about the supply shortages, especially in like these kind of key battery materials, um, and also the length of time from permitting to actually getting um, getting the finished product. So what what does this mean for the energy transition overall and, and, and what do you think needs to be done to kind of accelerate this? Whoever wants to. Oh, well, I, I think you've already seen governments, federal governments on the, in the Western world try from a policy point of view, provide signals that they want these commodities to be developed. Obviously, the Infrastructure Act out of the US, you've seen the UK comes, come with its Critical Minerals Act, and Australia is clearly trying to piggyback along both of those, saying, well, we're trade partners with you guys, we're obviously in the tent, um, and we clearly have all of those commodities. The challenge, as I said before, particularly for critical minerals, not so much for copper, but the rest of the industrial complex is there's no banks that will fund these projects. So you have to come back to the equity markets to raise your money. And, um, and that's challenging, especially when permitting continues to take longer. Um, inflation is clearly going to stay higher for longer. Uh, how do you progress a project as a single asset company when you're coming back to the equity markets and that's really your only funding source? And so governments can put all the signals up that they want these things to develop, and clearly they're writing checks. I mean, the, the US government has provided checks to um, Linus, they've pro provided checks to CIRA, so they're trying their best to pull forward that um, production. But at the end of the day, the smaller companies who are looking to get from discovery to production, the ones that aren't in production already, they go to, uh, and progress their project. The banks say, well, we want you to have a customer before we give you any debt, but then the customers say, you need to give us product before we'll sign an offtake so that you can go to the bank. It's a catch-22. So there's a real capital, that's one of the other key risks for the, that complex, is the, the access to capital. And I really, it's a challenge for us as investors because you always know companies need more money, but how much and how frequently is the question? Um, and who else is going to play in that space? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think the good news is, um, you know, the, the major Western economies are all on board with energy transition and even, even China. So you've got, you've got a, a global commitment almost that uh, we need to change the way that we do it. Um, so I think that's very positive. I think if you look at how we've gone over the last two or three years, though, you know, we're, we're falling behind already and we're not going to get there because the, the supply of commodities is not going to keep track with demand for commodities. So, so what do you do about that? I think... I think if you keep doing what you're doing, um, 
it's not going to happen. And so, so to me, there's probably two factors. One is technology, and the second is is raising capital in different ways. Um, on the technology side, we've talked about what's happened in nickel and what's happened in, in cobalt, and I think uh, technology innovation has been a big part of that, and I think that's got to continue. So if you look at things like, for example, carbon, carbon capture, um, you know, development of hydrogen in the lithium space, direct lithium extraction, uh, I think technologies that can just get resources to the market quicker or take carbon out of, uh, out, of you know, out of circulation has got to happen. On the funding side, I think government's got to do more. Um, uh, but I think uh, you know, end users have also got to do more. And you're starting to see that with the auto manufacturers starting to uh, you know, aggressively chase offtakes but also put equity in. And I think that's just got to happen more and more. So I think we've got to do it differently if we're going to keep on track for energy transition. It's interesting. Uh, again, this is not something I, I said, um, but I, I've heard it and I think it's quite, a, quite valid, is human beings as a species, we're better at dealing with consequences than we are at solving problems. So if you actually look at it, we will probably, you know, if you have the consequence of ch climate change, we're probably better at, at dealing it, with it once it happens rather than trying to prevent it. So uh, I think what ultimately if we don't have enough commodities to... Uh, progress the energy transition at the pace that people think it should go or want it to go, then the ultimate thing that happens is, is it just slows down and we have to deal with the consequences of a warming planet. That's, that's, that's ultimately how it will go. Um, you will get a price signal. If there's not enough copper, not enough lithium, the prices will explode, but that in itself creates a problem because then you know, everything becomes more expensive. And we all know that supply takes a long time to come. So, you know, if you have expensive commodities for an extended period of time, that's fabulous for the people who are in production at that particular point, but ultimately it's not really conducive to building demand because people will say, well, I'm not paying that. Um, they won't buy an EV. They'll just keep driving their, their um, you know, petrol or diesel car and, and as long as they possibly can, that sort of thing. Uh, so ultimately, it's, it's, if, if we accept that the energy transition is real and happening, and we worry that we don't have enough commodities to make it happen, then ultimately what happens is, is, is it just slows down. And, and there's not really much you can do about that. We have two comments from the audience. So. Yeah, interested in your comments, um, Clyde, I think it was, about the potential split in the aluminium production between so-called green production and, uh, and you know, dirtier production from, from China. And I'm wondering if that might apply to other commodities, in particular graphite. As we sit here today, 100% of the spherical graphite produced in the world um, comes from China. The only production on the horizon outside China is 11,000 tonnes per annum being produced in Louisiana by CIRA. The graphite purification in China is a fairly noxious process. I'm wondering if there's potential for a split to green graphite. Obviously it's been well supported by the, by the US government. They're pouring a couple of hundred million into the upgrade of the facility in Louisiana, but that's the only one on the horizon. So I'm wondering if there's potential for a split in graphite and maybe other commodities to this emphasis on, on green production. I think, it, I think it is an overall trend. Certainly the people who produce green commodities want there to be a split. They desperately want to split because they see that they'll capture more, more money out of it. But in graphite, you're right. There's just simply not enough green graphite going to be produced that um, will be able to create a separate market. If you get a price signal that people are prepared to pay a lot more in order to do that, then yes, you will get more developed. But as you know, it takes time. So, you know, whereas aluminium, it's, it's already in existence. There are smelters here, although some of the smelters here run on coal power too, um, here as in Australia. Um, there's some in Europe that run on, on clean energy. Uh, there's some that you could perhaps, um, you know, uh, that run on gas in the Middle East, that you could perhaps capture the gas at the point of combustion, things like that. You could, you could green them up. Uh, in various ways, and you could end up with a sort of grading of, of aluminium. Certainly the aluminium producers I, I've talked to, they're, they're, they desperately want this. But the people who buy the aluminium, they're not yet being forced to do it. So it probably takes a policy signal. So your car makers and other people who use lots of aluminium, they need to get to the point of saying, well, yes, we're actually only going to buy green aluminium and we'll pay a premium for it. Uh, 
were, but again, they're businesses, they're unlikely to do it unless they're forced to through some kind of carbon accounting of, of their inputs. But yeah, it's, it, I expect that that sort of thing will come because that's where the market is being driven to. We have another question uh, in the back. Yeah, hi. Uh, I have two questions. Question one is with the energy transition, I was just having a chat with the cab driver as well as driving, uh, coming from the airport to here. Uh, he mentioned that for the last five years, with the cost of inflation going up, it's very hard to make money driving taxi. But he's been doing that for social reasons. And I asked him, why not buy an EV? Maybe that may help you. And his question was, yes, I agree, but the initial capital cost is quite high and his monthly EMI will increase. But it's definitely much more cheaper than the ICE vehicle which he drives. So there is a segment of demographic who are in ICE and it is hard for them to make a transition to electric vehicle for the high capital cost. It is still considered as a premium vehicle. So we have that scenario, but for a younger demographic who are the first time car buyers, maybe that may be an option when EV price finally starts going down. So my question here is, when will that happen in terms of the next five years? And if that does happen, I can see a demand for lithium and nickel, all these commodities again spiking up from nowhere. And what, how do you see the next five years in terms of the consumer behavior changing? And question two is on hydrogen. How do you see hydrogen playing up in what sector, mainly in the industrial sector? Uh, how and where, like uh, from the uh, you know, flight as, as well? If you can see a helicopter view, as you mentioned. So, yeah, we'd love to get all three of your opinion. Thank you. So I, I might start on um, just on the, the EV comment because I think it's a really good one. I think the first point to note is um, if you're looking at what's happening in Australia, um, I think you're missing the point because Australia is pretty woeful as far as our energy policy and what we've done on EVs and the lack of sub subsidies, etc. So um, I think you can be pretty despondent if you look at the EV penetration in Australia and sort of... Um, translate that to what's happening in the rest of the world because I think most of, um, you know, particularly the Western economies are moving very strongly. Uh, I think you're right that, you know, one of the big, um, one of the big hurdles is, um, is the price of EVs um, relative to internal combustion engines. They're not quite there yet and uh, obviously the, the rise in uh, battery material prices over the last year haven't hurt that, uh, haven't helped that but, um, uh, but I think we're getting there. Um, uh, you, recently, we've seen BYD come into Australia with, with cheaper um, electric vehicles. I think that'll make an, an, an impact. And I think as technology improves and volume increases, prices will come down. So I think within the next couple of years, uh, there'll be a greater parity between the two. And I think that you'll see a pickup. And certainly that's what's happening internationally where there's more support. That's happening very strongly. So I'm pretty optimistic on that. And, and that's obviously a key driver of, uh, of battery materials. Um, I might leave the hydrogen discussion to, um, to Clyde. <laughs> uh, I, in terms of the switch in Australia, I, you're absolutely right, David. It's uh, had a very long... We're, we're 20 years behind the pack in Australia, but I do feel that by 2025, um, you will st start to see those prices become much more comparable and you'll start to see the real shift in behaviour. For taxi drivers, there are unlisted companies like Splend who actually provide a model by which they provide EV cars to taxi drivers um, and that is a way that they can buy those EVs over a longer term period of time so that that upfront capital is not so inhibitive. Uh, that's in place today. Those companies exist. Um, so there are ways around it um, today, but yeah, I'd say by 25, the actual sh sheer number. Um, the, the other section of that is the, the ability for the cars to become the batteries for houses and create um, smoothing of the grid from all this lovely solar top that we've got and that the energy market is saying is actually overrunning it during the day, but at night when the actual demand kicks in, there's no supply. Um, I think that that's something that governments really will start to understand in due course and perhaps then they'll start to see that these cars, they're not just a 
a car to drive you from A to B and sit at the train station all day. They're actually cars that can provide smoothing into the uh, electricity grid. So they've become a dual purpose. Um, but yeah, in terms of the hydrogen, I feel that's a longer debate. When I talk to companies uh, about their truck fleets, um, I'm hearing already that uh, Toyotas are being converted to electric vehicles, which are sort of the light vehicle utility vehicles on mine sites. But in terms of the big haul trucks, that needs a bigger solution, most likely a hydrogen solution, although the, for underground companies they're saying not this renewal of fleet, but by the second renewal of fleet, which would probably be three years away, they're starting to anticipate that they might expect to have a commercial electric truck that they can utilise underground um, to, and that will really save them on cost because now there's no emissions, they don't have to do the ventilation that they currently have to do. So they, they see there's a real benefit. The problem is there's just nothing commercially available today that can actually do the mileage and the 12-hour shift that you need these trucks to do. So that's probably a three, four-year story towards the end of the decade. And then the hydrogen, I suspect, is more the long-haul trucks that are driving across the country. Um, or you may see... I, we st I still feel that the petroleum companies may jump into the hydrogen space and when they do, they might go quick. They have obviously the benefit of, of a lot of profit right now and perhaps they need to think about how they deploy that, but I still feel like that's more of an end of the decade, beginning of next decade story. I haven't got any metrics to justify that, but it's just my feel. I, I think that's right. Just, just quickly on the EVs, if you actually look at it now in Europe, you can buy an uh, electric Volkswagen Golf for the same price as the ICE Golf. And that's without any subsidies in, in many countries. So we know the subsidies work in the driving down the price as you get economies of scale. So that can happen in Australia, but it just needs the right kind of incentives to, to happen. But um, you know, I know that you, uh, you're sort of looking at price parity for EVs to the same type of um, ICE car by about 2025 in this country. I agree with you right now, they're too expensive. Uh, so anyway, on the hydrogen, I was actually at the APIA conference last week and the Australia's LNG producers are very much seeing hydrogen as part of their future. They believe they have the know-how, the skills, the engineering ability to deliver these kind of massive projects. And given that they've done similar things with LNG, I believe they're probably right. The problem is um, it's a bit of a chicken and an egg situation at the moment. What are they going to do with the hydrogen? Hydrogen is difficult to, to liquefy and transport. Uh, you lose quite a lot of the energy in it. It's certainly nowhere near efficient as liquid, liquidizing, liquidizing, that's the wrong word, liquefying um, gas and transporting that. So it would be a much higher cost energy source for the Japanese. Um, if you look at how did the LNG industry developed, effectively the Japanese tipped an equity and they gave long-term purchase agreements. And that allowed uh, the companies here to spend all those billions of dollars building up the LNG industry. You'd need something similar in hydrogen, but people are still not exactly certain how that will look. Will it look like transporting ammonia? Well, if you make ammonia, you need energy to make it into ammonia. You need energy to make it out of ammonia back into hydrogen at the receiving port. Or you have to think of a use for the ammonia. Um, burning it directly in, in coal-fired power plants is a possibility that, that's technically feasible. But um, it's, it's like Karina says, that's, this is something that is coming, but not for a while. But it, it, it can possibly get there. Uh, but it's, you're going to... Effectively, your end users, your Japanese and your Koreans, really need to decide what they actually want, what works best for them, and then the, the investment dollars will flow. Do we have another question? Yeah. Uh, just this is about the uh, uranium. Uh, Clyde said that uh, there won't be uh, too much uh, uh, demand in the uranium in the future. But my question is that um, you know the uh, power reactor will play very vital role in the power supply. This is the base. That's the base supply they can provide all the time consistently in the grid. And if you're looking at the wind, wind farm and the solar, they fluctuate a lot. That means you don't know when there's a peak there. It doesn't mean that they are available when there's a peak, really peak there. At that time, you need the base, base load to maintain those, uh, those demands, peak demands. So this, we are talking about energy transition, 
how we can get there without nuclear power. You know, that, that's, that's, the, that's the, my question because um, it plays a very vital role in the power supply in the future. And it's getting, my, in my, uh, as for my study, nuclear power is getting more safer and safer than previously what, <coughs> what we had quite a few incidents before, but it's getting safer and safer and they are providing the small reactors as well to supply the power, uh, power, power grid. The my question is that how we can transit our energy without nuclear power? Actually, the, the answer to that is remarkably easily. Um, one of the great furphies, and it's actually solved by the fossil fuel nuclear industry, is that you need base load. Oh, we've got to have base load. Well, what are wind and solar? They're variable. You know, wind, solar obviously governs when the sun shines and wind when the wind blows. G great. What you have, if you are moving mainly to a variable source of, of generation, what you need is variable backup. You don't need base load. You need something variable to come in when your wind and solar are out. That's not nuclear, or it's not necessarily nuclear. It's definitely not coal. What is it? Well, it's batteries, you know, utility-scale batteries. It's pumped hydro, and it's uh, gas peakers if you want to rely on, on fossil fuel. And if you actually look at it, Australia basically runs at the moment on gas peakers. Uh, but they actually run something like 3% of the year. It's a tiny amount. So you're going to say you want to build nuclear power plants, the most expensive source of energy on a per kilowatt hour, a dollar per kilowatt hour basis. It's, it's more expensive than anything else on the, on the construction scale. And that's, what, that's the solution. It just doesn't make sense. For countries that already have a nuclear industry, yes, there, there is a certain level of sense there because they've got the skills and the experience to do it. For countries that don't have a nuclear industry, like here, it's, 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 it's beyond lunacy to even think about it. It's, it's, it's best reserved for the absolutely extreme nutty right wing of the National Party because that's where it belongs. It's not going to happen. It doesn't work. It doesn't make any sense. You could build all the other solutions at a fraction of the price and get 100% reliability. That's, it, it's just not... It, it doesn't make sense. Small modular reactors um, is like carbon capture and storage. It exists largely in, in um, press releases and happy speeches, but not in reality. Um, there is money going into it, but they haven't actually built one. There's not one small modular reactor working. There's a couple in experimental stages, but there's, you know, so to get that technology to the point where you can deploy it, I think it would work if you can get it. But then you're going to run into the, the whole NIMBY idea. I mean, who in their right mind really wants a small nuclear plant sitting in their neighborhood? It's just going to be an extremely hard sell to, 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 to the public. I mean, people have long memories. I, I agree, nuclear power is extremely safe. Fukushima was a, was a, a cascade of incidents and a few design flaws, and, which have all subsequently been corrected. But um, the idea that you're going to be able to sell the public on nuclear power is, 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 is gone. It's gone in the Western world. Uh, you can still do it in the authoritarian developing world because people can't really fight it. But uh, it's, it's, it's not really the solution, which is in some ways sad because it's a great source of energy. But it's, it's also very expensive. And I would add to that, even if you started digging your... Um, or build in your reactor today, it's not going to be delivering power into the grid until a decade from now. So they're not started today. They're not going to be a solution for 2030. And by the, if we are serious about achieving a 2030 target, then we have to come up with other solutions that we can actually deploy between now and then, and that really is the storage piece. We haven't really talked about other storage or battery um, technologies like vanadium redox batteries. Um, there are zinc bromine batteries. They're all still not really commercial. They exist. They have been deployed in, in jurisdictions, I believe, in China and in a small scale, and they seem to be ramping, but they're still... It's a very early stage, so I'm not sure that that's at scale yet. It would be great if they could get to scale. Potentially, they can do that by 2030. I'd say they'd need to be delivering commercially cheaper options in the next two years if you're going to be deploying by 2030, in my view. That's just my view. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you're right. I think the lack of uh, commercial scale batteries is really one of the factors that, that's holding the energy transition back. And um, sooner that can happen, the better. So, I mean, to wrap things up, because we are kind of getting to the end of the session, 
Um, you know, is that the major theme or narrative that's that's kind of pushing this forward? Is is it kind of the the, the storage um, solution that needs to be found, or what do you think? Kind of the the, the overarching commodity theme is for for the coming year. Um, I, I think it's one of the two key themes. The, the other, and we touched on it briefly at the outset, and that is just geopolitical risk. So. Who do you want to be dealing with? Who do you want to be buying these commodities from? And who do you want to be selling them to? Uh, is increasingly important, and and um, and people will sacrifice cost to have that security. And I think that's going to be an ongoing an ongoing feature. Um, the other side to that is is just the recognition that there's going to be volatility associated with that risk. And you're seeing it a bit out of, um, you know, even the social um, unrest in places like Chile and Peru and, and Ecuador. Uh, which are big producers of commodities like copper. So I think um, you're going to have more volatility in commodity markets aligned with that geopolitical issue. From I, I think EVs are the solution to the storage story. A battery that you, you can pay 20 grand for a Tesla Powerwall, which will give you three hours of battery, but you can plug your car in, which will give you three days of battery power. So I think that's perhaps the unsung piece. A car becomes part of your utility. Um, and so I think that that actually makes the car transition even more important. But we actually have to have regulations in Australia where you can actually charge your house from your car, where at the moment you're not allowed to do that. <laughs> so, again, we're behind the eight ball on that. Um, but, yeah, I agree with David that that pull forward or that policy decision that we need to look into geopolitical um, strategy is definitely key. You've seen it um, quite clearly with the US and the uh, EU um, how long, of course, it, will it survive a change of government, I guess, is the, the real question. Hard to know. Uh, if there isn't a change of government, you'd imagine these policies continue on to the end of the decade, but if there is a change of government in the EU or the US, which comes in with a very no um, decarbonisation campaign, you might see that fall away and we really will struggle to meet the 2030 guidelines. So, again, yes, agree, there's volatility in that it's hard to see... So whilst we say in the medium to long term there is a supply shortage and these commodities look good, there's still geopolitical risks through the election cycles um, globally on those matters. How do we... Um, again, that's where you go back to the bottom up and you look for the good quality assets and you try and find those assets that are going to be able to ride through those kind of cycles. Yeah, on the big picture... I think you have to make an assumption that the energy transition is real and here to stay, notwithstanding the risk of a certain person getting back into power in America. Um, and I'm not even certain that he could actually de derail it, even if he really wanted to. Um, I think he'll spend most of his time trying to get payback on his perceived enemies rather than actually derailing energy, because that, that would actually require work, and he's not very good at that. But nonetheless, if you actually look at... Um, the whole idea, if the energy transition is unstoppable or is a real thing, then it's just working out how best to position for that and you know how to deal with it. I think the key thing is that you really need to get the policy frameworks right. Uh, and that's, that's what's been lagging. Um, I think governments are starting to catch up to it, particularly in the Western world. I think they've actually um, started to, to, to realize that you know, they need to change the policies in order to incentivize the things that they want to happen. The, using your car as a battery is, is the classic example of that. Uh, but you need the cooperation of utilities who, you know, and you need the cooperation of consumers, people who say, well, yes, I'll charge my battery at work off the solar grid, and then at night I give my utility the authority to drain the battery, or at least partially drain it, to smooth out the grid at night time. But I still want enough power in my car to go to work the next morning, that kind of thing. You know, th 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 those require all sorts of regulations, all sorts of rules, all sorts of incentives. If I own an EV, why would I um, you know, allow the, my utility to drain the battery? Um, I've got to be incentivized. There's got to be money in it for me. It's got to make sense. So get the policy settings right, and basically you create a, a, a really good signal and things tend to work. If you look at countries that have done it well, like Norway, one of the world's largest oil producers, they have, um, you know, their new car sales are what now, like 80, 90 percent EVs. It's it's massive. Um, so, you know, and they did that on policy settings, um, not necessarily on subsidies, just on policies that encourage these that sort of development. So, get the policy, and everything else will come right. And I think that's uh, that's the key.
All right, great. Well, that sounds like a really good place to wrap things up. That was a really insightful discussion. So thanks to our panelists, Karina, David, and Clyde, for joining me up here this morning. Thank you.